hard to not. Okay. Uh, we are a people that walks by faith and not by sight, aren't we? And we've been learning this more and more on Wednesday nights, on these past Sundays. We are a people that walks by faith and not by sight. If we're going to walk by faith, then what do we have to have? We have to have His Word. We, we, we live our life according to what God said instead of what the world says, what the news says, what the doctor says. What We live our life by what God says. Is that right? All right, I want to read this. This is one of my notes. I mean, I, I wanted to just read a bunch of nuggets from Sunday, but seriously, we're about to get into the Word. Um, ushers, you can come forward. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, but I do want to read, I want to read this, this nugget from Sunday. In fact, I was writing so fast, and I wrote this note. I looked at the clock. Uh, get this phrase at 1140.4. You know, this is this is when it was said, and I mean, like I said, the Spirit of God just just talking, and so I, I went back to get what it said, and it said uh, he said this. So many times we as Christians are living by what we see and trying to put the word on what we see. That's living behind. That's living by sight. And that's why we're frustrated so many times. We're, we're living by the things that we see in the natural realm. And, and it's like he said, and then we're trying to slap the word on it. Instead of living by faith, by what God said. Instead of living by what God said. Amen. Man, that was strong. Man, that was strong. All right, Pastor. Awesome. And so, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about healing and we're showing the, the word tonight. Um, I'll tell you if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 6, I just wanted to uh, talk about tonight the full armor of God. And I, I don't know if I'm supposed to be doing offering or anything. I was just going to share something real quick on, that I thought is important. Yeah, go ahead and pass the buckets. Yeah, go ahead and pass it. Um, <clears throat> anyway, Ephesians chapter 6, and maybe you're familiar with the armor of God, talks about putting on the armor of God. One of the really fun things to do, maybe fun, fun for me, I love this uh, uh, website called Bible Hub. Um, because right, right, right there, you can click on the parallel. It'll show all the different parallels of that verse, but also right next to it, if you're on your computer or on your phone, you have to scroll down. But uh, it has the, the verse that you're in highlighted in blue, and you can click on just words, and it shows you the Strong's concordance or what the meaning of that word is in, in Greek, and, and it'll have its origin and things like that, and you can just really drill down. But one of the really cool parts uh, about understanding the, the language is understanding what kind of... Uh, of word is this? Is this a noun? Is it a pronoun? Is it a verb? Like, what is this? And so in Ephesians chapter 6, we're talking about putting on the armor of God. I want to just to, to, to highlight the armor of, or not the armor, I want to highlight the shield of faith, okay? Because this verse is written, and in, 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 in there's a couple of verbs that that have to be had or, or in order for the shield of faith. The shield of faith, it can be there, but it's not always activated, it actually says this, so in Ephesians 6, uh, it says, in addition to all this, in addition, it says, take up. Take up. That's a verb. That word take up, it means to let, bring it up and, and put it into action. So there, it's interesting. It's been ta talking about taking up. It, it, it's a verb. It says, take it up or put it, or, or put it where it needs to be out in front of you. Okay. So the shield of faith, just like what Mona was talking about, it's out in front of you. It's not from behind. It's, it's out in front of you. It's something that, that it, it, you're not working from behind you're, you're, unless you're retreating. Right. You're, you're, it's out in front. So it says take up, put it, put it in front. And so let's talk about how we steer our lives. What is it with our, the words of our mouth? And this is why it's so important even right now uh, as we were coming into this time, gosh, probably back in, in June, we, we were feeling like, um, I really feel like Wednesday nights, we need to put, uh, and what, what do you want to teach on? And I was like, I think we need to teach on, and it was like healing. Yeah, and it was, it was so cool how just, yes, yes. And so what is this? This is out front. This is out front before any like narrative or anything like that. Why? So that you can take, take up. 
put out front the shield of faith. Father, thank you. Like you can go Psalms 91 on the, the, talking about how there's no evil coming to my place. No, there's no plague coming to my place. We're, we're, this is taking it up. Okay? Out front. And it says the shield of faith, which you can extinguish. Which you can extinguish. So that, that, that's, the, that's the other thing. The, the shield of faith you can extinguish. So the faith, the shield of faith is not something that just sits. It's something that's, that is actually a verb. So it, it's something that's activated. Have you ever maybe watched Star Trek or Star Wars when they activate engaging the shields? Right? Okay. All right. Maybe this is. Okay. But they're activated. They're activated. And unless they're energized, right, you know, they, they would shoot, you know, we're going to take out the shield, shoot the torpedo and take out the, like if you could take out the thing that brings energy, then the shield goes down. So if there's not energy or it's not alive or there's not an alive word to you, your shield will be down. This is why it's so important for you and I to have an alive or a rhema word where God's speaking to us. And even right now with the words coming, we're going to have an alive word. God's going to speak to you. He's going to put it, put it in you, not just so it can go in you, but so that it can be activated and you can extinguish so, so that's what, you know, right now, I'm sure there's things in your life that need extinguishing. I know in my life there's things that need extinguishing. You know, a tormenting, is there a tormenting thought? Mm-hmm. That's the dart. How do you know if it's a fiery dart? Because here's what happens with the fire. You used to have to deal with it. And it's like when it, something gets shot at you, you know, there's one thing when the bird flies over your head. It's a whole other thing when you're having to constantly play cleanup. Have you ever not, you had to wake up in the middle of the night about the same thought, fiery dart? Fiery darts spread. That's the goal. It's one thought that spreads into every area. And I'll tell you, if there's a thought that's spreading it, right now, I, I'll tell you, it seems that a couple of thoughts that I, I've seen being spread. The economy or, or economics, a spreading thought that it's affecting everything. But also the one that's, that seems to be co- coming right now is this whole, um, I don't know, healing or not healing, but uh, sickness or it's going to be, it's going to be this way. It's going to be, no, no, it's going to be how? That's right. That's according to the shield of faith extinguishing fiery darts. And so we extinguish them by what? By raising up out front the Word of God. So anyway, just, a, just an encouragement uh, on the, uh, of putting on the armor of God. It's not just like a set it and forget it, wrong co um, You put the Word of God in you, in you and you put it out before you. Amen? And so we're going to hit it, maestro, and we're going to watch, watch this and, and hear from the Lord tonight. Five, twelve. Remember, this is not only for us here in the room tonight. It's for many, many others outside of this room all over the world. Many countries of the world are with us tonight by Internet or will log on later. That's not an exaggeration. Numerous other countries and many other people And so, this is a weighty message. And so, I want you to believe with me. Believe with me for this word to come out strong. Right? And for healings. Healings from this word tonight. Tonight. And healing working in people after tonight and tomorrow from this very word. So, we ought not rush it, should we? And miss it. Luke 5, 12... It came to pass when Jesus was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him and said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. This sounds like the prayer of millions of people, right? Lord, I know you can heal me if it's your will. This man asked the question exactly the way millions are asking and praying right now in 2006. Did Jesus answer him? Did he? Verse 13, he put forth his hand and he touched him and he said, 
I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. Was there power in that word? Something happened. Something happened in his body. There was power when he looked at him and he said, I will be clean. When you know the will of God, faith comes up in your heart. And he told person after person, your faith made you whole. Faith came up. When this man heard, not only could he, it was his will now. Right? The living Bible said, he said, sir, if you only will, you can clear me of every trace of my disease. Jesus reached out and touched the man and said, of course I will. Be healed. Don't you like that? Jesus said what? Of course I will. Be healed. And the leprosy left him instantly. Well, now we believe we got the answer to the question. Is it God's will to heal? Right out of the mouth of Jesus right here. He never changes and he's no respecter of persons. So if he said it then, he's saying it now. If he said it to him, he's saying it to you. Is he saying, I will? I will. You know, he never said I won't. People have tried to say in modern times that he often says, I, I'm sorry, it's not my will for you to be healed, or not now, or God's teaching you something through this disease, or any number of things, but you have not one scripture to back that up. You can't find any place in the gospel accounts where Jesus ever said anything like that, or whether they did that in the, in the book of Acts in the beginning days of the church. It is unscriptural, ought not be preached, ought not be believed. How many know if you can't find it in the Bible, you ought not believe it? And you ought not live by it and base your expectation on that. Well, we've begun then, since we're convinced of this though, looking at other scriptures and confirming that it is God's will for all of us to be healed today. Just like it's God's will for all to be saved and born again, just the same. It's God's will for all to be healed. Some people say, well, if it's God's will for all to be healed, then they'll be healed. Well, you could say that about people being born again too. But it's not true. We have something to do with it. What we believe. What we receive. And so the beginning of faith is being established in the will of God. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word, the anointed word of God. And when you know his word, you know his will. Faith is there. You can receive. So we have gone reason after reason. And we're up to reason number what last week? Reason number 10. Number one, God's Word is medicine. Number two, a strong spirit will sustain you. Number three, the original creation. Number four, God's will in heaven. Number five, the origin of sickness. Number six, sickness is a work of the devil. Number seven, the covenant of healing. Number eight, the eternal names of God. Number nine, sickness is a curse. And number ten, types of redemption. And we shouted about the Passover lamb, didn't we? And the atonement and the serpent on the pole and and uh, year of jubilee and yes. right yes. and our premise was if we can find healing in the type, what does that prove? There's healing in what the type was a type of, yes. right? Yes. Redemption. Yes. So I want to get into in it tonight. To Number eleven. We are sure it's God's will for all to be healed because healing is a part of redemption. Just as much as being saved from hell, just as much as being born again, healing is a part of redemption. It belongs to you equally with forgiveness of sin. Now, go with me again to 2 Corinthians Scripture we looked at last uh, week. Second Corinthians, the first chapter, I believe it is. And verse 20. Second Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him Amen, or so be it, 
unto the glory of God by us. How many of the promises of God? All, All of them. Now, we have said this before, and I, I, you may not know why I'm being so repetitive about it or so strong about it, but it is a big, big issue. I am convinced from the Word that there is no blessing available to mankind except through Jesus. Did you hear what I said now? That is an all-inclusive statement. I don't believe that, you know, God goes around that and does things any other way. To do so would be unjust. God, the Father, the Creator of heavens and earth, is the righteous judge of all the earth. He is known. Throughout time and eternity in all the universe, the Bible says he's known for his righteous judgments. And he's, no matter how much he loves you, he's not going to pervert justice for you. He's not going to do wrong or do something unfair or unjust for anybody. So the only way he would have a right to do something for a man or a woman is through redemption. That way he's justified. He is uh, the just, he's justified, the Bible said Jesus is, and he is the justifier of those that believe in him. So if, any, now, if anybody ever got healed, Old Testament, Gospel accounts, New Testament, last week, if anybody ever got healed, I'm saying, I believe the Bible is saying, it was based on what Jesus was going to do or what he's already done. You and I are looking back to the cross. It's already happened. It's already done. We're about to read in Isaiah 53. In fact, be turning there right now. Go to Isaiah 53. And you know that in this chapter, it says, uh, with his stripes, we are healed. Doesn't it? That's good news, my brother, sister. With his stripes... We are healed, but how many know 1 Peter 2.24 uses a different word? It said, by his stripes you were healed. Why? Isaiah is looking by the Spirit to the future. Jesus hadn't been born yet in his time. Right? The cross hasn't happened. The scourging hasn't happened. Him being raised from the dead hasn't happened on the earth. But he's looking at it in the spirit and he says, by whose stripes you are healed. But Peter, Peter's on the other side like we are. The Lord has come born of a virgin, hung on the cross, scourged at the whipping post, raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of majesty. And now he says, by whose stripes you were healed. Everybody that ever got healed throughout the Old Covenant and the Old Testament and all those years through the prophets and the law, they were healed based on what Jesus was going to do. Everybody that's ever been healed was ever healed in Jesus' ministry. All the masses and thousands that were healed in his earthly ministry were healed based on what he was about to do. And then anybody and everybody that's ever been healed since then have been healed based on what Jesus has already done at the cross. Do you believe that or not? All the promises of God, every one of them, find their fulfillment and, and God's, the Father's ability to say yes and so be it, you can have it. It is all and it is only through Jesus. Oh, he's our hero, isn't he? He's everything. Huh? I get worked up when I start talking about him. Jesus is it. He's everything, isn't he? He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the first. He's the last. And he's everything in between. He's it. There is no salvation apart from him. There is none. He is the only way. He's the way. The only way. There is no deliverance. There is no healing. There is no freedom. There is no blessing from God except through Him. 
through Jesus. But now here's the thing. If he did buy and pay for healing in his work of redemption, how many does redemption belong to? Hmm? How are you going to say, when you, if that's true, and then somebody's going to come back and say, well, some, some it's God's will to heal and some it's not. Hold on, hold on. If it's true that he bought and paid for it through the work of redemption, why couldn't you say that about other parts of redemption? Why couldn't you just as equally say it's God's will for some to be born again and some it's not? If he bought it, if he paid for it, if he accomplished it through substitutionary sacrifice, it belongs to whosoever will believe all the time, forever. Glory to God. Go to Isaiah, please. 53rd chapter. I need you to stir up and stay with me tonight. And don't, don't get tired and don't quit on me. I need to stay with us till we get this done. Hmm? I'm telling you, people are going to play these CDs years from now and get healed while they listen to them. Not because of me. I didn't write this. I didn't do this. He did it. Hmm? So let's get it out right tonight. Hmm? Let's get it out right. There's nothing more important going on at your house than this. Isaiah 53, are you there? Isaiah 53. The Bible says, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The answer to the last is the answer to the first. Who has the arm, the power of the Lord revealed to them? It's the ones who believe the report. He'll grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. There's all kind of romantic notions been brought up and tossed around about Jesus. And people portray him in his earthly life as operating as the Son of God. No. Now, I know this may sound hard for you, but do you believe the Scripture or not? There was no beauty that we should desire Him. What does that mean? People met Jesus on the street by the droves and didn't look twice. Hmm? He looked very ordinary, very regular to the masses. And it got worse from there. Verse 3, he is what? Despised and rejected of men. He was. Now the cross to us is honorable and holy. But in that day, it was not so. We go around, you know, you see people all the time with crosses hanging on there. Their, their necklace or their bracelet or, or, or on their stuff. But in that day, it would be like an electric chair hanging on your necklace or a hypodermic that said lethal. I know some people don't like to hear that, but that's what it was. It was the most gruesome death reserved for the worst criminals. And it was written in the Bible Cursed is one who hangs on a tree. And everybody assumed that if a man died that kind of death, he was a curse of God. He had it coming. He deserved it. And that's what the masses who knew about it believed. With many of the people, that were on the fence. If you read the scriptures, you'll see that some of them were saying, well, he's a good man. And other people said, nah, he's deceiving the people. And there were quite a few people on the fence. But when he actually was hung on the cross, then the masses said, well, there it is. He's a curse of God. Can't be a good man. He's the worst criminal of, worst of criminal sorts. 
I know that's hard for people to hear it, but you need to hear it to see what happened. He was, I, I'm not making this up, Emma. Read the verse. He was what? He was despised. He was rejected of men. He went, the uh, second verse says he wasn't noticed. You know, he went from not being noticed to being despised and treated as the worst criminal. But now get this. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, it's kind of sad that the King James translates this this particular way because it's building up to the very next fourth and fifth verse that deals with our healing. And these words that are translated griefs are in other places in the same Bible translated sickness. And this words that's translated sorrows are in other places in the same King James Bible translated pains. Don't take my word for it. Study it out for yourself. But let me read some of it to you. The uh, the Young's translation, and Young's is a very highly respected literal translation, says, verse 3, He was a man of pains and acquainted with sickness. Verse 4, surely our sicknesses he has borne and our pains he has carried them. Did you hear this now? This is what the scripture is saying. Uh, Numerous other places, like I said, these words are translated sickness and pain. Now, why am I taking time and talking about this? We know He bore our sins. That's widely known in Christendom. Did He bear our sickness when He bore our sin? Did He carry our pain when He carried our punishment? The Bible says He did. Isaiah is in the Spirit. The Holy Ghost has come on him. And he is a prophet. He is a seer. And he is seeing through the centuries into the future. And he sees this. And he writes what he sees. He sees one who came. And he starts off by saying, Who believes this report? Who believes this? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He said, He's coming. But He won't stand out. He's coming. I see Him. There's no marvelous beauty in Him that will make you goo and ga over Him. He'll be despised. He'll be rejected. He'll be, uh, what's the word? Executed. As the worst criminal. Oh, but this is what's happening. He's bearing our sicknesses. I see it. He's carrying our pains. Oh, can you see this? He goes on to say that He was bearing our iniquities also and our sins and the chastisement of our peace. We know from 1 Corinthians, He was made poor for us. This is the great exchange. We saw in the types of redemption, we saw the word atonement again and again and again. And you see it all through the Old Testament. Atonement is not a New Testament word. I know we use it all the time, but it's not. Study it for yourself. Atonement is an Old Testament word. It means to cover. But Jesus did not atone for our sins. I know that sounds strange to your ears, but study it out for yourself. He did not atone for our sins. That means He did not cover our sins. The Bible says He put them away once and for all. We do not have the covering of sin. We have the remission of sin, which means you're free from it. Once it's done, it's not covered where somebody could find it. It's gone. Nobody can find it. 
It is removed. He took it upon himself. And he took it away. During those three days and nights. He took it to the pit. Are you listening? And, and we've been taught some of this, but in many, many circles we have not been taught that when He took our sin, He also was taken our sickness. This has not been taught. He took our sickness. Let me give you some more scripture. This word, here translated griefs. Are you with me in Isaiah 53? I get excited, but I don't need to move too fast. Verse 4. Surely, when the Bible says surely, if it just said it happened, it'd be true. (laughs) But when it goes ahead and says, surely, surely he has borne our griefs. That word griefs is the Hebrew word koli. Twenty times that I know of. Somebody say twenty. Twenty other times I know of in the Old Testament, it was translated disease or sickness. In fact, I I heard uh, some individuals, that, and, and this is an interesting thought, this is hearsay, so don't build a doctrine on it. But Hebrew and Greek scholars know these things. And an individual that was, pre, was on one of the committees, this is many years ago, doing one of the, what we call the modern translations, when they got to this passage, and they, the, they, there were scholars from all different camps because they want to make it fair. It wasn't just a Baptist and a Presbyterian. There was from all different camps. But these are highly educated men in the original languages. And, and one of them said, well... This has been translated sickness and disease consistently in these previous verses, but it's not what the King James says. And there was a big discussion about it. And finally, one, said, well, one person said, well, if we do that, if we put sickness and pain in there, people will get the wrong idea. And it'll play right into these uh, divine healing people's error. And other people, two of the guys said, if you don't translate it the way we've translated it, the other previous X amount of places, we're quitting because it's just good Bible translation. And the result was they quit. They left the committee and it was translated griefs and sorrows with a footnote. Don't take my word for it. Study it out for yourself. But I'm telling you, score, you know, many other times this same word is translated sickness or disease. What does the scripture read then, if that's so? Surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. So you better stay awake tonight. This can last you the rest of your life. Surely, he has said out loud, surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. I'm telling you, that is literally what these words mean. But if you have any question about it, I got the answer for you right here. I don't care if you don't know Hebrew or Greek or anybody that does or can't find a concordance. I know of a commentator on this. In the New Testament. His name is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who inspired Isaiah to say this. So I reckon he would know what he said. And he quoted this in Matthew the 8th chapter. Go there now. Hold your place here. We're coming back. But go to Matthew 8. If you couldn't read the concordance... If you didn't know about it, and you wondered about it, all you got to say is, Holy Ghost, what, what were you saying over there in Isaiah when you said that? What were you saying? Matthew 8. Are you there? Yes. Matthew eight sixteen, 
8, 16, Matthew, when the even was come, they brought to him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. All, A-L-L, all. Verse 17, that. Oh, now get this, get this. All were healed. Somebody say all. All. Is healing for everybody. Is redemption for everybody. Is believing in Jesus for everybody. He healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, who said himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. If the Holy Ghost said in through Matthew that that's what he said through Isaiah, then I reckon that's what he said. Surely. Oh, glory to God. Friend, listen to me. When you come to believe this, just as strong as you believe he bore your sins, you'll be healed. Just like you're saved. Surely he has borne our sicknesses. Surely he has carried our pains. Why? So we could bear them for his glory? That doesn't work. So he could continue to teach us things through being sick and diseased? That doesn't work. Why did he bear our sins? And the penalty of our iniquities so we could be free from it. So we wouldn't have to bear it. Why did he bear the chastisement of our peace? So we could have peace. Why did he bear our sicknesses and carry our pains? The very next verse in Isaiah says, you're healed by stripes. Go back to Isaiah 53. Mm, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Surely, surely, He has borne our, somebody say, my. my. Surely, He has borne my sicknesses and carried my pains. Yet, it says, we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Now, you're going to have to hear with your heart over the next few minutes on this. Smitten of God. Beaten. How is it that we're healed by His stripes? Stripes are the result of a beating. Now, there are numerous thoughts about this, but go back to the original words and you'll see. When the, the word for stripe, it, it, you, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it means a wound or a bruise. It, it has to do with a, the idea of a welt as well. Like when you're struck with a rod. In fact, the word rod is frequently used in connection with this. Somebody say rod. rod. Beating. Beating. Stripe. Stripe. Beatings are punishment for disobedience, for rebellion, for breaking God's laws. And under the, uh, under the Old Testament, they were given instructions how these kind of things were to be carried out. Listen to this. Don't try to turn there, but Deuteronomy 25, 2 and 3. Deuteronomy 25, 2 and 3. It shall be, if a wicked man be worthy to be beaten, the judge, somebody say the judge, will cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. Beaten. 
You're not beaten because you did well. You're not beaten because you obeyed. Be you're beaten because as punishment for disobedience and rebellion. Listen to Proverbs ten thirteen. A rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Proverbs nineteen twenty nine. Judgments are prepared for scorners and stripes for the back of fools. Said out loud, stripes Stripes. are for the backs of fools. See, why would they need a beating? Because they hadn't listened to talk. Talk does no good with them. They're, They're rebellious after hours of instruction and pleading and everything else. And so a beating is the next recourse. Now I know this is politically incorrect. But this has been in the Word from ancient times. And people were beaten as punishment for their crimes, weren't they? Discouraging has to do with this. Now, there's difference between Roman scourging and Jewish scourging. And I know with the the Passion uh, movie and, and, and all the blood from the scourging, and I'm not saying that that didn't happen like that, but you have to be watchful that you don't lose focus. It didn't say, uh, by His blood, we're healed. I guess the Lord could have said that if He had wanted to. Right? What did it say? By His stripes, we're healed. By His stripes. He was tied to the whipping post. He was beaten. There's all kind of debate about what instrument was used and how it happened. And don't get too carried away with that. Just stay with the focus. He was beaten. He he did not have to do this to go to the cross. This is something else. Right? He could have went to the cross without doing that. It was an awful thing. It was terrible. They tell us people died sometimes just from being scourged. And you know he was in bad shape after the scourging. They made him carry his cross and he was so weak. He stumbled. He fell. Why did he do that? Now you'll have all kind of people try to say, well, for our sins. That ain't what the Bible said. Why was he scourged? Why was he beaten? Well, for our sins. That's not what the Bible says. It says by his stripes. The result of him being beaten is you being healed. Now, whether you understand this or not, you can believe it. Proverbs 20, verse 30. 20, verse 30 says, The blueness of a wound cleanses away evil. So do stripes the inward parts of the belly. In fact, if you look up the word that's in uh, 1 Peter 2, where it says, By his stripes you were healed, it's, it's the word for bruise. Bruise which would be the result of being struck with some kind of an object, usually a blunt object like a rod or stick. But he said the blueness of the wound cleanses away evil. I saw an interesting comment. Uh, This is an old, well, not not as old as these (laughs) words, but uh, an older colloquial expression where somebody's child was acting up or just acting sulky and pouting around and somebody said, what's wrong with that kid? And the other one said, ah, all they need is a good dose of strap oil. (laughs) A good dose of strap oil. Now that's an older colloquial expression. What does that mean though? They need a good whipping. Strap oil. 
Oh, they're acting sick and puny. Oh, all they need is a good dose of strap oil. That'll fix them up. How Healing and beating. Beating and bruises and healing. How do these go together? Simple. Sickness is punishment. Are you listening? Sickness is punishment for breaking God's laws, for rebellion and disobedience. Don't let your mind run off on some tangent. Stay right here with me. Is, this, is that statement true or not? Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. We, we went through it just recently, verse by verse. Was part of the penalty for breaking God's law, being sick and diseased? Sickness is punishment. That's why it is such a perversion for preachers to get up in their pulpits and act like sickness is some kind of a blessing in disguise. No. Sickness is punishment. Poverty is punishment. Hell is punishment. Right? Grief and vexation of mind and soul is punishment. Punishment for the disobedient. Punishment for the rebellious. Was Jesus disobedient? Certainly not. And he never was sick. Hmm? Was Jesus rebellious and disobedient? No. And he, wa- he had everything he needed. He had abundance. He enjoyed nice things. Did he ever have broken peace? Did, was he anxious? Did he have times of depression? No, because he was not punished. He was blessed. He lived in the blessing not to curse because he was obedient, not disobedient. But here, the prophet is seeing him being treated like the worst criminal and seeing him smitten of God. Oh, come on, friends, you'll have to use the eyes of your spirit to see this. Uh, Are you still in Isaiah 53? Isaiah 53, 4. Isaiah 53, 4. Let me read some other translations to you. The, The Lisa translation says, Only our diseases... Did he bear himself and our pains he carried? Goodspeed says it was our pains that he bore, our sorrows that he carried. The Jewish translation says, Surely our diseases he did bear and our pains he carried. The New American translation says, It was our infirmities that he bore and our sufferings that he endured. The Amplified and the Knox says, We thought of him as someone punished by God, stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God. Somebody say, punished by God. God. Smitten by God. Why would a person be punished by God? Sins. Disobedience. Right? Breaking his laws. Rebellion. Listen to verse 5. He's pierced for our transgressions. He's bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is on him. And by his bruise, there is healing to us. By By the results of his beating, to us there's healing. Verse 6. All of us like sheep have wandered each to his own way we have turned... And Jehovah has caused to meet on him the punishment of us all. The punishment for all your mistakes and failures would have been broken fellowship with God, your sins staying on you, broken uh, broken peace, no confidence, having to go to hell when you die, but includes being sick and broken and defeated in this life. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the righteous judge should punish those who have sinned. 
And the punishment involves all these things. And that is justice. And it ought to be that way. Except. Except. If somebody else will take it for you. If somebody else. See, God is the righteous judge of all the earth. And He knows what's fair and what is not. And He has set this up from the beginning that somebody else can take your place and pay it. And it's just as paid as if you paid it. Jesus took our place and He took the punishment for all broken sin and broken covenant. He took the punishment which included sickness. And it happened specifically, not on the cross, that happened later. It happened specifically when he was tied to this post and he was beat, beaten. People could see the soldiers beating him. What they could not see was the spiritual blow. When Jesus in the garden sweat drops of water and blood and was in such an agony? Was he recoiling over being beaten with the Romans instrument and hung on the cross? If if he was responding like that, it's said that some of his followers after him acted with more bravery. I know you don't like to hear that, but you need to have your eyes open. There was so much more he was looking at. what was going to happen to him in spirit. When that was happening to his body, something else was happening in his spirit. Read this. Verse 10. Isaiah 53, 10. It pleased the Lord to do what? Who bruised him? We, by his bruise, and we say stripes, but really this is the same word that's translated bruise. Same word. By his bruise we are healed. Was it the bruises the Romans put on him? Mm-mm. Read it again. Who bruised him? Lord. Who bruised him? Lord. And this sounds strange. It pleased the Lord. How in the world could it please the Lord? To bruise him. Because him who sees the end from the beginning could see your face. And my, oh, come on. And knew that his beloved son would be strong and would do it and would rise from the dead and would soon be at his right hand in glory. And he could see your face and he could see mine. Somebody said, and he was bearing our sins. He did, but not specifically on this verse. Said he was bearing our sicknesses and carrying our pains. This has not been preached. It's been referred to. It's been alluded to. It's been run over quickly. This, my friend, is Bible and it's true and he did it for you. Say, surely, Surely. he took my sicknesses. sicknesses. He carried my pains. pains. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Now, if you're paying close attention, that's the same word, grief. Same word that the translators had a failing heart. And wouldn't put it in. It is the Hebrew word for sickness. He has put him to sickness. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Listen to Young's literal translation. Jehovah has delighted to bruise him. He has made him sick. Uh, JPS translation says, It pleased the Lord to crush him by disease. 
Rotherham says, He has laid on him sickness. Who did it? Who did it? See, I, I'm not trying to minimize this now. Uh, being beaten was awful. Being nailed to a cross was awful. But that was not the half of what happened to him. That was the small part of what happened to him. What made him sweat drops of blood in the garden? What made him pray and say, if there's any way, if there's any way, Father, let this cup pass from me, and had to bring himself back to it and say, nevertheless, not my will. Why? How many understand Jesus is not weak? Jesus is strong. And he's looking, this, looking at this and shaking his head. He's crying. He fell on the ground from being overcome with the pressure of it. Why? Because he's going to hang on that cross in a few hours. And all of the ugly, terrible, evil, and iniquity and sin of every man since Adam until the last man that's going to be born and live on the earth is going to converge on his sinless, spotless spirit. And he's not just going to empathize with it. He's going to become it. And when he becomes it, his God is going to turn away his face from him. And he's going to be separated from the Father. Why do you think he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the full brunt of God's judgment is going to come on him. That's why he was crying and sweating blood and and falling. But before he went to the cross, there was something else. He was tied to the scourging post. His clothes were ripped off. And he was beaten. He was beaten like a criminal who deserved to be beaten. But the Bible said, Isaiah is not seeing Romans. Isaiah is seeing in the Spirit. Centuries before it happened. And what did he say he saw? God is bruising him. God is putting him to sickness. Old oh, friends, get this in your mind. Get this in your mind. The Romans or the, the soldiers, whoever it was, with whatever they had, it's not really that important, were hitting him and hitting him. And when they were hitting him, it was causing wounds. It was causing bruises. It was causing... But what you could not see is God struck him. With the core, somebody said, for our sins. No, it's not what it said. It's not what it said. Struck him with the spiritual root of every disease and every sickness that mankind would ever know. So when the Romans were beating him, from the hand of the judgment of God was coming on his spirit. On his soul, the root. How many understand? You can take cancer cells and put them under a, a microscope. There's a life in them. There's a spiritual mobility in them. What's keeping them alive? What's making them grow? It's spiritual. There's a spiritual root and core and cause of every disease. You can't see it with a microscope. God laid that on him and beat him with that when the Romans beat him in the physical. And by that beating, no matter, you, here's, here's the lie. The devil will say, well, yeah, you know, God can heal. And he loves you and all that, but you've messed up. You've missed God and you've missed His plan for your life and you've messed up so bad and you failed so bad. Exactly. That's why He was beaten. To say I can't be healed because I've messed up doesn't make sense. And yet it's one of the favorite lines of the enemy. Well, you've messed up. You've come short. You've failed. So you, you, don't, you don't have a right... If you have messed up and deserve to be punished, including being broke and sick 
That's why Jesus is there at the whipping post taking your beating for you, taking your sickness for you, taking your disease, taking your spiritual beating for you, which is sickness and disease. Oh, can you see this or not? Don't let this get away from you. Meditate upon this. Talk it. Think it until it gets built up in your spirit because I'm telling you, the revelation of this will heal you. Will heal you where you sit. Just like a man can be born again right where he sits just by believing the Word. This is the same Bible. Glory to God. Now go to Acts. Get ready to shout. Get ready to shout. Shout, I mean sure enough. Shout. While you're turning there, say it out loud. Surely. Surely. He bore my sicknesses. sicknesses. He carried my pain. pain. And by his bruises, bruises, I I am healed. Now I moved too quick. You need to find Acts 22, but you need to get Isaiah 53 back. I didn't say something I should have said. Can you see why I said this is weighty? This is, this is the gospel, my brother, sister. This is the great exchange. This is the good news. We need to major on this. Not minor on it, major on it. Isaiah 53, verse 4, well, verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of pains and acquainted with sickness. Now, if you don't have that in your Bible, you ought to write it in there. I've given you numerous reasons why. Don't take my word for it. Study it out for yourself, but get it done and write it in there. And write Matthew eight seventeen right beside it. A man of pain, acquainted with sickness, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and esteemed. We esteemed him not. Surely he bore our griefs, our sicknesses, and he carried our sorrows, our pains. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Who smote him? God. God. He was wounded for our transgressions, not his. He was bruised for our iniquities, not his. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He deserved no punishment. We did. But if he took our punishment, do I have to have it anyway? No, come on. Think about it. It is so obvious. I mean, let's say you're in another country. There are still numerous countries where you you break one of their laws, they'll take you right out on the street and tie you and beat you with a stick. Let's say you and I were rambling the world on vacation and you broke somebody's rule and didn't mean to. Next thing you know, they're going to take you out and they're going to beat you until you're silly, maybe die. And I say, well, look, wait, wait, wait. Can I take their place? I mean, maybe I, let's say if I was younger than you or I was a little stronger than you. Can I take their place? They said, yeah, it's accepted under our law. And what if I went and, and, and let they beat me <laughs> and it took me three weeks to get over it before I could walk? And yet they show up at your house, you know, right after that and say, you know, come get your beating. We come to beat you. You, you, you broke the law. You deserve it. What would you say? What would you say? Come on, tell me. What would you say? You would say, "Uh uh-uh. No. Keith took my beating. Now, come on now. If you let them beat you anyway, why did I do it? What good did it do me to take that if you let them beat you anyway? By his beating, we're free. By him taking our punishment, then legally we should not be punished. Even though we're the ones that committed the sin, because even though he didn't commit the sin, he took the punishment. Now get this. Let's get stronger as you go. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. What does dumb mean? Not talking silent. So he opens not his mouth. It said it again. Say it out loud. He opened not his mouth. Say it again. He opened not his mouth. Say it again. He opened not his mouth. Let's say this scenario I just played out for you. We're in this other country. You got in trouble. I let them beat me to keep you from having to be beat. They come to your house the next day to beat you. What if you don't open your mouth? Hmm? Then you're going to get beat. Why? Did you have to get beat? So said, well, I learned something through it. Well, you weren't supposed to. <laughs> if you got beat, then I took the beating in vain for no reason. This is, the, the gospel is substitution. Redemption is exchange. You know why you're not going to hell? He went. You know why you're not going to pay the price for your sins? He did. You know why you don't have to be sick? He took it. It's exactly the same through the whole realm of life. Say he opened not his mouth. See, it repeats it for emphasis. It says it again. He opened not his mouth. Now look at Acts 22. Acts 22. Get ready to shout. Acts 22. Jesus has gone to the cross. He has paid the price. He took our beating for us and he died in our place. Say it out loud. He took my beating at the at the uh, scourging post. He died for me at the cross. In Acts 22, Acts 22, uh, Paul was preaching in this particular place and as frequent with him, they either had revival or riot. And frequently both. And here they were having a riot. The people got so mad that verse 22, as he finished up his trying to preach to them, they gave audience, this is Acts 22, 22, they gave him audience until this word and they lifted up their voices and they said, away with such a fellow from the earth for it is not fit that he should live. And they cried out and they cast off their clothes, and they threw dirt in the air. That's devil stirring people up. The chief captain commanded him to be brought to the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging. That's what they did to Jesus. So they took him in. So that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. Do you understand what they're going to do? Scourging, what would we call it today? Torture. They're going to strip him down. They're going to tie him to the post. They're going to ask him some questions and they're going to beat him. And they're going to ask questions and beat. And ask questions and beat. And he may live through this and he may not. Scourging. Paul, the apostle, the preacher. And... Verse 25, as they bound him with thongs. Now get the picture. They're tying him to the post. Just like they did Jesus. Now, now, now when they tied Jesus to the post, what did he say? Tell me what Isaiah said. He opened not his mouth. Now they're tying Paul to the post. <laughs> How, what, what do you think Paul ought to do? So, so, well, he ought to be like Jesus and open not his mouth. Not if Jesus did it for you. 
What, get this now. What Jesus did as your substitute is not your example. Two different things. There are things He did as our example. But what He did as our substitute is different. It's not our example. It's in our place. On our behalf. I'm just about through, but stay with me now. Help, help me finish this up. They're tying the man of God to the scourging post. Just like they did, exactly like they did with Jesus. Hadn't been that long since they did it to Jesus. And as they're tying him to the post, he says, he opens his mouth. <laughs> oh, can you get the picture? They're tying him up. Ah, they took off his coat. And they tied him up to the post. He can hear that guy, kapow, warming up his whip back there. Kapow. And he said, hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Shut up, you about to be beat. I said, hey. Is it legal to beat a Roman citizen that is not convicted and found guilty of a crime? Is it legal? He knew it wasn't. They knew it wasn't. Oh, he opened his mouth. Don't you know he was glad? He knew about his rights. Now, we, we don't know about this, but in those days... If you were not a Roman, you were nobody. You were nothing. I don't care who you were, who you thought you were, what you had. I mean, somebody finds a dead body in the ditch on Monday morning. The authorities want to know, who is this? Are they a citizen? Nah. Not even an investigation. Non-citizens could be slaves, could be property of somebody else. Non-citizens were nobodies. But if you were a Roman citizen, you had rights. I said you had rights that the whole kingdom and the emperor himself backed up personally. You could, I, any Roman citizen, you could appeal your case all the way to Caesar yes. himself yes, you if you didn't like what was going on. Paul did. It's a matter of Bible record. Didn't he? You remember? Remember he stood before Agrippa and, and, and those guys and he said, I appeal to Caesar. He's in shackles. And they looked at each other and said, what did he do? And they confer with their lawyers and said, hey, you've got to send him. You don't want to get back to Caesar that you violated his Roman rights. And they said, you appeal to Caesar? To Caesar you will go. He had rights. Why is this in the Bible? Why, why, why is this here? The Bible said, our citizenship, this is in Philippians. It's the Greek word polytuma. It means citizenship. It says, our citizenship is in heaven. What do you think it means that your name is written in a book? And I'm telling you, in time and in eternity, if you ain't a citizen of heaven, you are not anybody. I don't care who your family tree is, how much money you got, what kind of political class. When it's all said and done, there's only going to be one roster that matters. Oh, but here's the good news. Here's the good news. If your name is in that book, if you are a citizen of heaven, you have rights now. Right now. You have rights right now. Now, masses of Christians don't know this, and so they're silent, and they take it, and they take it, 
and they take the devil, tearing up their affairs and hurting their babies and destroying their finances, and they just take it and they go, well, you just never know what the Lord's going to do, and we don't know, and they just take it, and the devil is beaten and stealing and killing and destroying, and they don't even know they have any rights. Much less stand up and speak up for them. What if Paul had been quiet? What if it is just sit there and go, well, you know, I have made a lot of mistakes. I guess, you know, I guess I deserve a good beating. Lord, help me to be strong. Take it like a man. Lord, give me strength. Lord, give me strength. Lord, give me strength. Well, if that's all you know, the Lord will be merciful and He'll give you strength. But there's something better. <laughs> there's something better. Come on, help me out. What did he say? Hey! Wait, wait up! <laughs> this guy's back here going, kapow! He's warming up the big old brute of a guy. Kapow! I mean, this is all this guy does. This is his whole profession. What do you think he does in between scourgings? He flicks uh, flies off a fence post and works out. He's just waiting for somebody to take a part. He's going to flail him. Flay him, I'm trying to say. That too. Either way, you don't want it. What do you say? Come on, help me out. What do you say? Hey, wh wait a minute. Wait a minute. Get, 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 get this word. Get this word. Is it lawful? See, the devil is counting on you not knowing this. He is a spiritual outlaw. And he wants to take advantage of you because of your ignorance. He wants you to be quiet and take it. He said, Is it lawful for you? Beat me like this? Uncondemned? A Roman citizen? He knew who he was. He knew he had rights. Look, look at it, look at it. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain. First, you know, he told that big brute of a guy with a whip, hey, whoa, whoa, wait. Just go sit down. Wait a minute. And he went in to the chief captain, the head man. Friend, this is symbolic of devils. This is symbolic of the devil's hierarchy. Principalities, powers, rulers. The enemy come, start doing something to you. And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Not in my house you don't. Uh-uh. No, you don't. Now, is it legal? Devil, is it legal? If you come in here and do this, and immediately those lower level devils have to go, huh, whoa, 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 what, what? Well, ask, ask the boss devil. I, they said it's illegal. I don't, you know, these lower levels are pretty dumb. And they go, he said we couldn't kill him with cancer. He said, what? He said, he is a citizen of heaven. And we can't, and we can't do it. So they said, well, whoa, 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 time, wait, wait. We don't want to cross God, you know. Whoa, whoa, uh, go ask big devil. And he went in. And he told the chief captain, he said, you better watch what you're doing. Because this man is a Roman. You better watch out what you're about to do. The chief captain got out from behind his desk. <laughs> Came down to the courtyard where Paul is still like this. And now the head man comes down and says, Hey. He says, What's up? <laughs> Now, come on, what if he hadn't spoken up? What if he hadn't spoken up? 
He said, they tell me you're a Roman. Is that true? <laughs> Aren't you, don't you think he was glad he could say, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yes, I am. Roman citizen. That's right. And he said, uh, with a great sum, I obtained this freedom. You know, in these days you could be born to citizens and you'd have citizenship a lot like it is today. You know, that was Paul's case. Or you could do some great exploit in the military and Caesar could award you citizenship. Or if you had enough money and knew the right people, you could buy it. Some things never change. <laughs> if you knew the right campaigns to contribute to and he and he said he said it cost me a lot of money to get my citizenship Paul said all right I understand that but I was born this way I was born free I was born into this I didn't earn it and I didn't buy it I was born into this Then straightway they departed from him which should have examined him. That's the word for torture. And the chief captain was afraid. What a turn. They're treating him like dirt. They're tying him to the post. Chief captain didn't even stay out there. He went inside to get something cold to drink. They're going to beat him into a pulp. Now he's scared. Head man is scared. Because he knew he was a Roman and because he had tied him up. Oh. Did you get the picture? When he looked up from there and he said, I was born this way. I was born free. That's why I got all these rights. That's why I'm protected. I was born into this. And, and the chief captain said, untie him. Untie him right now. Uh, Mr. Paul, we are sorry. We, we didn't know. Uh, mm, I hope you don't feel the necessity to report this to Caesar because would you come inside? Man, I got some fresh lemonade and some... Gra I'm sorry. Get me some... I think some of my clothes would fit him. Would you get some and bring... Sit down here, Mr. Paul. I'm sorry. Oh, we got some stuff on your clothes. I'm sorry. He goes from being, you know, about to be scourged and beaten to loose and respect. Yes. Friends, you were born into this. You didn't earn it. You didn't buy it. You couldn't do enough to deserve it. But when you looked up and you said, Jesus, I believe on you and I receive you as my Lord and my Savior... You were born again. And you were born into this family and into this kingdom. And your name, your, 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 your name. Your name is in that book. And that book is a book of the redeemed and the ransomed. It is also a roster of the citizenship of the eternal kingdom of God. And as a citizen, you have rights. You have rights. You have rights. But you must know them. And you must stand up and you must speak for them. Jesus opened not His mouth. How many know He could have? Oh... Did, don't you remember what it said when he's when they're they're appealing to him? He said, "Don't you know I could call on the Father right now? He'd send me legions of angels." And what would do? They would take him out of there so fast. I mean, they'd wipe out every soldier within a hundred miles of there, just like that. But you'd still have to pay for your own punishment. He could have Jesus when they tied him to the whipping post. 
And they started beating him. And not only them beating him, but the hand of God was striking him with the core spiritual cause of every disease and sickness. And it was crushing him and bruising him to his spirit's core. He could have said, I appeal to justice. I don't deserve this. I've done nothing wrong. I appeal to the Almighty and justice. If he had spoken up, he would have been delivered because he didn't deserve it. And we'd be lost. We would have to pay the penalty for our sin. That's why Don't you know he wanted to say something? All he had to say was a word. That's all he had to say. All he had to say is, stop it. How many know when he said, I am, they all fell on the ground? (sighs) Our hero. Think about the strength it took. Think about the self-control. Think, all you got to do is say a word. And you're out of it. He took it. He took it. He opened not his mouth. He let him lead. Nobody. He said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down and I pick it up. He was not in their hands, in their control, nothing he could do about it. He let them do it. And like a lamb led to the, before its shearers is dumb and just stands there and takes it. He opened not his mouth. And it said it again. He opened not his mouth. You know why he opened not his mouth? So we could open our mouth. Let the redeemed of the Lord. Let them open up their mouths. And let them say it. And when anything that is stealing and killing and destruction comes and starts to pound on you and affect you, you better not sit there and go, well, I don't know if it's the will of God. You stand up and you say, no, you don't. No, you don't. Is it lawful? You ignorant devils, is it lawful for you to work cancer in my body and I'm uncondemned? A citizen of heaven? Oh, you deserve it. You've messed up. I did deserve it. But he took the beating. He took the sickness. He took the pain. No, you don't steal my money. No, you don't. Is it legal? Is it lawful for you to steal my prosperity? No, you don't. I call you on it. I challenge you before the high court of heaven. They'll run scared to their superiors. And they'll back off from you. That's not my words. Resist the devil and he will flee flee from you. Glory to God. Wow, huh? So you can get it tonight. That's good, huh? You can get it, but you can't just get it. You got to got it. You got to you got to get this. This is something that you, we can sit down with our Bible and our notebook and we can got to go along again and again because this is the Word. This is the Word. And uh, two, two scriptures I want to give you. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 3. Unless a man is born again, he cannot become a citizen of heaven. Unless a man is born again. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so this is this, this very thing. But how are you born again? So this is the passage that I, I, I want you to study for yourself. It says, that, oh, backwards, upside down. I could have read it anyway. But here we, it says this. Uh, but what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth. This is Romans chapter 10, 8 through 18. Well, I guess you could go all the way to the end, verse 21. But it says this, but the word is near you. It's even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Salvation. So what do you got to do? You got to believe in your heart and you got to say with your mouth. You got to speak up. For with your heart you believe and are justified. And with your mouth confession is made. Or, or with your mouth you confess and are saved. It is, ju- it is just as the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Therefore, there's no difference between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and gives every, 
gives richly to all who call on his name. Everyone, verse 13, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You call upon the name of the Lord. You could put that there. Who calls on the king, the king, your king, okay? You've entered the kingdom. Now, listen to this. How then can they call on the one whom they've not believed? And how can they believe on one whom they've not heard? What you heard, to, just, this is the word. But how did you know to call on that if you didn't know? How could you know to call unlawful? How could you, how could you know unless you heard? How can they believe in one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can they preach unless they are sent? This is why it's so important to preach the word. And this is why it's so important to be a part of preaching the word. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Now listen to this. But not all of them welcome the good news. Even tonight. You might not welcome this. For Isaiah says, the Lord, Lord, who has believed our message? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. But I, I ask, did they not all hear? Indeed they did. Indeed they did. Not only did they hear, he says this, it says, um, the voice, uh, their voice has gone out into all the earth and their word, the, the words to the ends of the earth. I, I asked him, did, did Israel not understand? Did Israel not understand what he's saying? Well, how come you're coming? He's talking, I'm coming. This is Romans. Paul's coming to the Roman people. It was to the Jewish people, okay? But why are the Jews, why don't they get it? Did they not know? Did they not hear? Oh, they heard. They just didn't receive it. He said, they didn't only just hear. He said, I showed them over and over and over again. I, I took another people that didn't belong to it, and I tried to make them jealous. I went to other nations and gave what was theirs to them, but they, but they wouldn't what? They wouldn't believe. They wouldn't receive. And, and this, is the, this, is, this is the word, the word of salvation. It's near you. It's even in your mouth. But let me tell you, it will not be in your mouth. The shield of faith will not be raised. If it's first not received in your heart. John 3, 3, and, and this Romans, uh, Romans chapter 8 or 10, 8 through uh, the end of the chapter, you go look at that and study it and you say, am I hearing? Listen, it doesn't matter that what you, just because you know, we talked about this last night at Night of Prayer, uh, are we believers or are we waiting seers? We're believers. Salvation comes when you Believe in your heart, and you, you open up your mouth. And I'm just telling you, when you look at in Joel, and he talk, where he talks about, in the last days, I'm pouring out my spirit, and he talks about how, I'm telling you, we're going we're, we're gonna to see, because, because it's just like, wait a minute, this is what's mine all along. It's time that, that when Jesus left the disciples, and he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, and he said, these signs will follow those who believe, it's time that they follow. Anyway, Father, thank you for tonight for your word. Thank you um, just, for, just for just a timely word. Thank you for the anointing on it. Um, that even the places that we w w would be uh, held strongholds of, of ways of thinking, uh, thank you that it breaks the yoke, the anointing breaking the yoke. Father, thank you for your word. It is life to us. It is life to us. It's light to us. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And we just say we received your word tonight. We receive it. And we meditate on it. We put it for, for us again. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, we're going to dismiss you all. Uh, and we'll see you guys Sunday morning uh, for Jehovah Ra, which is the shepherd. So anyway, we'll see you guys.